uh, Mackenzie Nicole Adams, uh, a nine-year-old girl who actually wanted to grow up to be a scientist. Uh, Cleo, I'm going to start with you, uh, behavioral um, health analyst and expert. Just uh, your, your thoughts on this tragic story. I think there's, it's easy to talk about social media and isolation, but I think it's a huge issue missing from this analysis and perspective. This young lady was called ugly black blah, 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 blah. One of the things that's happened among black children, particularly once you get past the 70s and the 80s, is that we're not teaching, we're so busy assimilating and trying to do well in this society. We're not preparing our children to live in an anti-black society or a society with anti-black messaging. So they don't know how to negotiate with it because they have not been prepared that it's a reality. So when it hits them, it's, they're like a deer in the headlights, depending on the child, and they become very vulnerable and traumatized instead of going, wait a minute, that's not true about me. I am not black and ugly. You got a problem, not me. And a lot of young children are not, black children are not trained to realize that this is a society that's infected by a corruption called white supremacy and racism. The lack of critical analysis makes them second guess themselves and, and consider the ugly consideration around what they look like because the society is anti-black. All that to say, and to be repetitive on purpose, is that parents need to prepare their child for living in a society that whether it's media or whether it's other kids at school, that's going to put out anti-black messaging. And they need to learn to separate the toxic behavior from who they really are. And frankly, based on my own work with youth, which occurs weekly, most children are not being prepared to critically analyze and reject anti-black notions. They're, the lack of preparation, they, they internalize them, and they might wind up not just kill, killing themselves. Some people don't do that, they just take drugs. Julian? You know, I can't tell you how many layers of heartbreak uh, I experience when looking at the story. First of all, because black girls are very rarely allowed to be girls. Black girls are always assumed, as black women are, that we can take it, that whatever comes at us, we're supposed to be able to take. But this was a nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. She was a nine-year-old. And, you know, what Dr. Gardere said, we've been together on more than one occasion and often talked about how parenting, Roland, everybody was not your parents. Everybody was not my parents. I mean, so you could, a teacher could not look sideways at me without Protea Malvo being up in the school saying, what the you know what? And she didn't say the you know what, but she like, you better leave my child alone. Um, but our parents understood the context in which we grew up. Many of these parents who are young sometimes, Roland, they didn't have good relationships at school, so they don't know they're supposed to go in there and put their foot down and say, fool, do not let anybody mess with my child. So the, what, what, the burden that our society places on black women trickles down to black girls, and this was a little girl. And so I literally, when I read the story, I cried. Um, because I, I just thought about the young women that have been in my life, both as a college president and as a mentor, and the many ways that we live in an anti-black society that hits you, hits you, hits you, upside the head, upside the face. Yep. That, and, but then, how did these other children learn a meanness that allowed them to tell a little girl to kill herself? Uh, you know, th there maybe have been other things going on, but I think that the school clearly was myopic, I think that the parents were not involved early enough, and I'm not blaming them at all. But what I'm saying is that this is happening, and when we begin to unpack it in the context right. of a racist, sexist, capitalist patriarchy, racist, sexist, capitalist patriarchy, we see how this young girl became a victim. Court. Well, I mean, obviously, this is a completely, completely tragic incident. Um, I agree with the other panelists that I think there are special um, and unique challenges that black girls face. And it sounds to me, too, like the school um, was not handling it well um, in terms of the mother saying, hey, we reported this, and then the school saying, we didn't know about this. So it's hard to say what kind of reforms need to be put in place there. But it does seem, especially with the upticking in these types of suicidal issues and whatever cyberbullying does play into it, I think that schools uh, do need to be more involved and um, hopefully you know, this is a wake-up call to people. Well, and, this is, and this is the thing about that, when you, when you think about this story and, and so many other stories, when you think about the interactions that go on with students every day, that teachers are not always around. Yeah. What happens on school buses, mm -hmm. what happens on 
uh, what happens literally uh, in classrooms, what happens on playgrounds, what happens in lunchrooms. Uh, and we're hearing more and more and more of these stories. And we're hearing more and more again, of course, bullying, bullying, bullying. And I think, I think, I think also for a lot of us, when we think back to our childhood and, and, and how we grew up. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know, look, I can recall um, there was an incident on, one of our, on our school bus where, um, where these were some students, they had actually, they, they were, you know, horsing around and one of the students actually pulled the sweater of a girl exposing her breasts. And, uh, and it was another student who was named Roland. So folks were blaming me and I'm like, hell, y'all talking about I wasn't even involved. And so that was some students who said, oh, no, no, we're going to beat him and his brother up. My dad was like, okay. So my dad, my dad <laughs> rolls up to the school, gets on the bus and says, who the hell is trying to target my sons? And one of the kids tried to sit here and be bold. This was middle school. And he pulls a knife out. My dad said, really? He said, give me that damn knife. Set it out of his hand. And I literally said, let me be clear. Anybody touch one of my sons, you're going to have to deal that with me. That was an involved parent. No, nah, right, was... right. But, but it was, but it was, the, but, the, but, but, but the thing, <laughs> my dad had no problem, you know, putting fear that in was, other kids. But that was an involved parent. And what you see so much less now, for so many reasons, are parents who are not involved. Uh, Look, I was, when I was at the Field Show, you remember the story of the brother in Florida where they were, uh, they were pulling his daughter's hair and they were pelting her with stuff. And the doc, and the dad got on the school bus and said, mess with my daughter again, I'm gonna kill one of y'all. And they targeted him, and he said, look, my daughter had been picked on, had been bullied, had been berated. He said, and I had to come to the defense of my daughter. And he was in trouble, and I was on the show with him, and I said, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm with the daddy. That man said, well, my job is to protect my daughter. Cleo, you want to make a point, go ahead. We keep referencing that the school didn't do anything. I want to go back to the fact that if black parents are actively involved in their children's lives, which apparently happened with you, and apparently happened with you, you have role modeling of how to critically evaluate the situation and know the difference between you and their madness. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the child does not know Oh, yes, to, oh, yeah, they were involved. If the child does not know the difference between dysfunction, madness, and corruption and who they are, they fall for the corruption. So I want to reiterate the fact that schools are supposed to be there to do what they do, but this has to start at home. Pa parents need to, I, I gotta re I'm sorry, I gotta reiterate this. I'm trying to make Go it. ahead, go ahead. For example, after, I do a lot of speaking engagements as well. And I remember speaking to some parents after Dylan Roof did the murder. And I asked those parents. Manual AME in, in uh, Charleston. Yes. Right, and I asked, I asked this room full of parents in, um, well, I forgot what city it was in. But I asked them, did you talk to your children? First of all, I said, are your children aware of the Dylan Roof massacre? And there were children in the audience, and they were shaking their head like this, and the parents saying yes. I said, did you actually take your child to the side and give them opportunity to tell you how they felt, to actually express how that impacted them so they can actually have a way to negotiate it instead of, instead of internalizing the implication that something's wrong with being black because Dylan murdered these people. And majority of these parents, it was 300 of them, had not engaged their children about these issues. Mm -hmm. So they're walking around confused. There are children I've run into who think that to even say something is racist is racist. You know, so I, we got to give our children the capacity to critically analyze the situations and, and nine is not too young. Got it. I want to genderize this just a little <clears throat> bit because when things happen to black boys, they act out. Their tendency is to act out and then they're demonized for acting out. When things happen to black girls, they internalize. It's a very different coping but strategy. But boys do too. There's been a number but, but, of boys who have committed suicide. Finish, There's yeah, been a number yeah. of boys who have killed know, themselves. But, 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 but by and large, when you see stress with black boys, you're more likely to see the acting out behavior, which then becomes criminalized. With black girls, what you see is the overeating. You see a whole bunch of stereotypical behavior. They're taking it in. And that's what this girl did. People saying, kill yourself, kill yourself. And she was taking it in. So we do, while I agree with you completely, Cleo, about the fact that both internalize, it manifests itself very differently. And we have to look at that different manifestation in terms of the ways, because black women, there's a connection, Roland, between the first story we had and this one which is the demonization of black women, the marginalization of black women, the inability to deal with the way that society denigrates black women. Well, let's also deal with the race aspect. This was a black girl who had a white friend and she was being attacked because of that friendship. Corey, then we'll go to the panel. 
Yeah, I, obviously that is a very, very tragic situation in terms of being demonized for that. And I think there are probably people who are black and people who are white who are guilty of making assertions like that, as you were saying at the beginning of the show. And so that's really sad, and I think it also alienates people who might come from a more mixed-race background, too. And that's something, I, like both panelists have said, begins at home in terms of that level of education. And um, if the children who are bullying are acting like that, they need to be educated as to why that's not appropriate. So we don't know the racial makeup of this school. Yeah. We don't know if these were black students who were attacking her because she had a white friend, if it was white students attacking her because she had a white friend. Uh, she was friends with this boy, and she would ride with her family to school. Um, go ahead. She may have thought, I don't know this. I'm not betting on this. This is a, this is a deduction and a projection. She may have had a white friend because of her anti-black perspective. She may have value. Okay, here's, okay, here's, 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 here's the piece. Now that you're speculating. Uh, wait, I wait, just wait. said it. Right, but no, but here's, here's a piece. I'm speculating. No, no, here's, here's a piece. Here's a piece. Of it happens. It. But the one thing is, I don't speculate. I, I like to operate with a set of facts as we know it and speak to that. But we can't know. But we do know this. We know that a nine-year-old girl was bullied and committed suicide. It was called black and ugly. And, and, but, but, and, by, but by who? And was so wounded by... By other being, students. By, by other students. students. So but we don't know if these were white students or black students. No, 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 but here's the deal, though. She was so and, wounded and by it being called black and ugly, she killed herself. And, 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 and hold on, hold on, hold on. One second, one second, hold on, hold on. There might be other factors that weren't reported. But you know what? But hold on, one second, one second. One, one second, one second. The reason I think this is important because because we don't know who said it, actually, it doesn't matter. I do believe that what has to happen, is to, to Cleo's point, is that parents do have to arm their children properly, whether their critics are black or white. I agree with you. Yeah. Let, indulge me for just a moment, Roland. There is a poem by Warren Cooney. It goes, she does not knew, know her beauty. She thinks her brown body has no glory. If she could dance naked under palm trees and see her image in the river, she would know. But there are no palm trees on the street, and dishwater gives back no images. This has been the space of black women, that we are very rarely lifted up as beautiful. If you are blonde, if you are white, if you are light, if you have green eyes, you are lifted up as beautiful. If you are just your basic black woman, you are not. And in a society that values beauty, that values beauty, black women, whether you're nine or 49 or 29, are beaten down and have to have, essentially, the buttressing of our self-affirmation, and it simply does not often happen. This case of this young girl, of this gorgeous, phenomenal, wannabe scientist young girl, is a tragic case, but you see it replicated with young women who are sure. 19 and other, sure. and so I, I really, as I said, we take your first case of the young woman who killed her pimp, and then you take it to a nine-year-old, and it really, the continuing thread here is a denigration, devaluation, and fear of black women and our strength, because there would be no America were it not for black women. Roland, I want to reiterate that whether the people that victimized this young girl were black or white, the insults were anti-black. Let's be yes. real clear. And people agreed that there was an anti-black reason to, to criticize her because we live in an anti-black society and black people internalize those anti-black implications, which is why black parents need to sit down with their children and teach them that this phenomenon is in the landscape and maybe I'm gonna teach you how to recognize this and understand this so you can recognize who you are and deflect this madness, because baby, it's madness. And, 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 I, and the final thing I want to say, I have to say this because I know this is the work I do on a daily basis, Dr. Malvo, everything that you just talked about that black girls go through, including eating in a whole nine yards, black boys go through the same thing. But and, and, but, 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 including but, including but, dying in the arms of white folks. Remember the young boy in, excuse me, young man in L.A. with the with the congressman, whatever you, I don't know what he was. Remember the young man, the young homosexual? Oh, uh, 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 Jamel. The guy was a, the uh, Buck was a big time. Uh, Ed Buck was a big time Democratic fundraiser. Right, and he and and a young boy died in, in basically seriously it was kind of it, like sex trafficking it, in and of itself. In his house that was that was drug paraphernalia that's all about around. It's but not all, a pity part. But, 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 no I'm not going to compare our pain what I'm going I'm to say. I'm encoding not comparing. No but I'm saying that we have to look at the genderized aspect of this. Yes black black people are under attack in our society but when you look at the ways that gen, intersectionality where race and gender play you must look at the difference between what happened with this black girl and talk about the way that not just race but also also, gender becomes an oppressor. The court also, also and, man, we have and male is a gender, too. 
And of course, we also have to deal with white parents and how their children are also responding to a black girl who is friends with a white student. Yeah, absolutely. That's 100% true. I grew up, um, my best friend growing up was, she had a black father and a white mother. And the first time I really realized racism was a thing was when I, we probably were no lot older than six or seven. And a woman across the street. Where? I grew up just outside of Boston, Got it. which see, people think it's progressive, but there are also oh, some we'll racist. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I know. You're I like, would, I would, right. Well, right. in terms of like it being a, in terms of it being a blue no, state, right? Right, right, right. right, right. right. So, it's, right. It's, yes. it's a blue state, but that's a different thing. So, so this is so this is the thing. So so we've heard this lady was taunting me and my friend. Again, she's half black, half white. She was yelling across the street at this family. Oh, you guys are the Oreo family, and making like very odd racial comments. And that was when I started to realize, okay, this really is a problem. And if there are white people who are hearing this and don't speak up about it, don't also talk with other um, people of different races about this and understand that this is happening. And this is something that troubles me. I'm kind of the token right of center person here today. And I will say one thing I have really trouble with some of my fellow conservatives is they say, oh, I'm colorblind. Race doesn't matter. That's easy for you to say. So I think white people need to be talking about that more. I'm going to keep talking to white conservatives well, about Corey, that. I have one word for you. Yeah. Louise Day Hicks. <sighs> Do you know who that... You, you're, you're a little young, but uh, Louise Day Hicks was a white woman who was on the Boston School Board who said <laughs> she would lay down on the street before she allowed black children to go to white schools in South Boston. Yeah, My girl said right. she would lay down on the street and let the school buses roll over. I'm like, right, yeah. please, go All for right, it. All right, gun edge. <laughs> All right, folks, back to our whole mark unfiltered video in just one moment. We want you to write this website down, marijuanastock.org, marijuanastock.org. Uh, and so here's why, as we transition into the holiday season, this is the time, of course, when we start thinking about giving and sharing. And sometimes the best gift can be something some, can be something you give someone, which is an opportunity that can potentially change their lives. That's why our friends at Transatlantic Real Estate have created an investment opportunity for the everyday investor. It involves legal marijuana and crowdfunding. And we all know that legal marijuana has created one of the fastest growing industries in the nation, a multi-billion dollar industry. We also know that crowdfunding makes it easier to be an early investor of an opportunity, but it gets easier. Transatlantic real estate is different. They have a business model that is simple to understand. What they're going to do is they buy land that supports marijuana grow operations and lease it to licensed high paying tenants. Now, you, what that means is you're investing in the landlord of a licensed marijuana farm in a high growth market. Now, you can invest little as 300 bucks up to $10,000 before the company goes public. And here's the piece. They have recently extended the offer, which means you still have time if you take action now. Now, keep in mind, you must complete and confirm your application to participate. So be sure to complete the process. Now look, don't spend all of your money over the holidays and end up with uh, empty pockets. Instead, get a return on your investment. You can also consider making this an investment for someone special. To get started, go to marijuanastock.org, marijuanastock.org. If you want to get in the game, you can do it now. Now back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered video.